you may be wondering why I've just jumped off this massive cliff. Uh, I'm starting to ask myself the same question, but before I get into that, let's do a deep dive into an incredible icy moon of Uranus. This is Miranda. It's the smallest of the five major Uranian moons at roughly 470 kilometers across, and as you can see from its surface, it's a collage of craters, coronae, and cliffs. This gorgeous photo was taken in 1986 as Voyager 2 flew past Uranus, capturing this crystal clear image of the chaotic Mirandian surface. But 38 years prior, Miranda was a mere dot on a photographic plate. This is Plate 18, taken on the 1st of March 1948 at the McDonald Observatory in Texas, and was used to confirm that this faint smudge was indeed a moon of Uranus. Two weeks earlier at the same observatory, Gerard Kuiper, the astronomer for which the Kuiper Belt is named after, was photographing the four known moons of Uranus to study them further, when he first spotted this tiny speck hugging the distant gas giant. Originally denominated Uranus 5, Kuiper soon suggested this moon should be given the more pleasant name of Miranda, a prominent character from William Shakespeare's play The Tempest. Which actually didn't make a whole lot of sense, because at the time the four previously discovered moons of Uranus were all named after fairies from either the works of Shakespeare or Alexander Pope. But Miranda is a human character, and while Ariel is also a character from The Tempest, at least Ariel adhered to the divine trend of naming Uranian moons after spiritual characters. Thus, naming a moon after a human character led to the utter shambles that is the naming convention for the moons of Uranus. Anyways, back to the moon at hand. Miranda's surface is one of the most unique in the solar system, one that has puzzled scientists since it was first photographed up close. Voyager scientists put on quite a show at today's press briefing, and satellite Miranda was clearly the star. That may sound like hyperbole, but at the press conference the day after Voyager 2 captured these incredible images, Dr. Larry Soderblom, deputy leader of the photographic interpretation team, opened the event by stating, no one could anticipate the exotic nature of what I'm going to show you this morning. And when asked to speculate on the origin of this bizarre hybrid that is the Mirandian geology, he simply said, give us about 24 hours. Cut to 24 years later, and scientists have concocted several explanations for how the surface came to be, specifically these groovy canyoned weird structures here, collectively known as coronae, but also known as corona. <sighs> I didn't plan to mention corona in this video as it instantly dates it, and this is purely a coincidence, but that's what they're called, because they look like crowns apparently, although colloquially they're referred to as racetracks, which I much prefer. Anyway, back to the moon. Originally, it was thought these groovy racetracks were the result of a massive impact on Miranda, one that shattered the moon into a jumble of floating rock and ice that managed to reassemble itself, like a determined zombie who got hit by a mortar but is already late for work. As Miranda put itself back together, some parts of the moon were thought to have been rockier than others. Since rock is denser than ice, the rockier chunks of the surface sank towards the core of the moon. These sinking rocky sections would have been about the size of Wales, Fiji, and West Virginia, meaning as they sink, they're going to be met with a lot of friction as they pass through the moon's icy mantle. Cast your mind back to science class, and you'll remember that friction causes heat, and heat melts ice. The heat from the friction and the melted ice created these currents of warmth within the moon, triggering all sorts of funky activity on the surface. Now that seems plausible, right? Well, annoyingly, there's a few things that don't quite add up in the splody put back together model. One such stickler was the appearance of the racetrack wrinkles and the ridges on the corona. The triangular patterns and the parallel fault lines are much more consistent with something pushing up and stretching out the surface, not stirring it up and pulling it down. This has led to the more widely accepted theory that Miranda's corona and cliffs formed from a process known as upwelling, where underground warm material rises up to the surface. In the case of Miranda, this warm material pushed up against the moon's icy surface, which offers an explanation for the following coronal features. Number one, the cliffs. If you push on ice, it's gonna break, and that's just what happened here. As the warm material pushed on Miranda's surface, it caused it to expand, forming these large bulges, and in some cases, splitting the surface. These splits are known as rifts, and not only would they create the cliffs we see across the coronae, but these splits also allow for cryovolcanic activity. Think a volcano, but it spews out ice instead of lava. Which also explains... 2. The Grooves 
If the splitting is due to warm material pushing upwards, said warm material will then leak out. This type of volcano is a long, thin tear in the surface known as a fissure vent, examples of which we have here on Earth. So, most of these grooves are likely to be fissure vents, allowing for warm material, most likely in this case a mixture of water and ammonia, to ooze out of the splits and smooth out the surface. Alright, now here's where it gets interesting. It's pretty much a given that Miranda formed by the accretion method, and like all of the moons that originated this way, it will be differentiated, meaning it has a rocky core surrounded by a layer of mantle. This is the standard structure for most of the major moons in the solar system. Now taking a look at the non-corona bits of Miranda's surface, and they're practically covered in craters. A general rule of thumb in planetary science, if a surface is covered in craters, it means it's quite old. So this means the warm upwelling that caused the corona happened long after Miranda had finished forming. But Miranda is tiny, and the smaller an object is, the quicker it loses heat. Calculations show that any heat generated as Miranda formed will have dissipated very quickly. Quickly in this case being a few hundred million years compared to the age of Miranda, which is most likely in the billions. Introducing yet another spanner in the works, where did the heat that caused the corona come from? The answer? Tidal forces and orbital resonance. Today, Miranda's orbit is basically circular, with an eccentricity that's practically zero. But at some point in its history, way after Miranda had finished forming, but long enough ago for the corona to freeze and acquire a few craters here, here and here, this moon's orbit was quite different. Long ago, Miranda was in an orbital resonance with the fellow Uranian moon of Umbriel, where for every three orbits Miranda completed, Umbriel would do just the one. This increased the eccentricity of Miranda's orbit to 0.1, making its journey around the gas giant more oval. This oval orbit meant Miranda was constantly changing in distance from Uranus, where the closer the moon got to the planet, the stronger the tidal forces became. Now, tidal forces distort the shape of the moon, squashing it along the direction of the gravitational pull of the planet. But as Miranda got further away from Uranus, the tidal forces decreased, and the moon became less… uh… squished. Like how a stress ball gets warmer the more you squeeze it, the squeezification of Miranda due to the fluctuating tidal forces has been calculated, through some very complicated maths, to have increased the internal temperature by 20 Kelvin, which is enough to cause the permafrost ice beneath Miranda's surface to melt, thus triggering these upwellings of warmer material that cause the corona to form. Problem solved. Now, all of this information about Miranda, its origins, and how its surface came to be, has been interpreted by hundreds of scientists, from just a handful of photos taken over two decades ago by a satellite built in the 70s. And bear in mind, only the south pole of Miranda was photographed. We have no idea what is on the other half of the moon. The cameras on Voyager didn't have selfie mode. The amount we have learned about this fascinating icy moon from just a few dozen images is truly remarkable. But there's just one more thing I want to talk to you about, and that's this compelling fault on the outskirts of the Inverness Corona. This is Verona Rupes, and with a staggering 20 km drop, it's the tallest cliff in the solar system, and the very ledge I jumped off at the start of this video. Now, given the gravitational pull of Miranda, it would take me about 12 minutes to hit the bottom of this canyon, with a final speed of 200 km per hour. And considering I've been talking for about 8.5 minutes now, I've still got another 3 and a bit to go before I turn into a very small crater at the base of this immense cliff. So in the meantime, why not leave a comment and tell me your favourite feature of the Mirandian surface? Oh, and I just want to say a huge thank you to Robert Papalado for helping me understand the origins of the corona. I've included some of his papers in the video description, so check them out if you want to learn even more about the coronae of Miranda. Well, bye!